You may be seated. So our pastor is away, and uh, if you don't know, he's on vacation with his family. So pray for them as they're away. Uh, and also, I say this every single time, if you're a first-time visitor here, please come next week to hear our pastor preach, uh, and you'll uh, thoroughly enjoy that. But I'm just here this morning to step into his place uh, to bring the word this morning. And if you would, take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter 5, that's where we'll be here this morning. But before we begin, this is 4th of July weekend. Um, have you guys have heard fireworks already? Raise your hand. Yes, fireworks. Are you the one doing the fireworks? Raise your hand. My wife and I live in San Bruno, right? And um, for some reason, they've been doing fireworks since the beginning of uh, June. Uh, and it's been insane. It's like all hours of the nights, right? And, and they're just popping off, boom, boom, making our car alarm go off. And we have a dog as well. Her name's Olu. And Alu hates fireworks um, so much that if we would leave her outside during the day, which they do fireworks during the day, I don't know why you would do that. You can, can't even see them. Um, she will, in the backyard, she will hear those fireworks and run to the sliding glass door and begin to bite off the frame of the sliding glass door. Like to the point where she like tears it apart um, just to get inside, right? Uh, and we don't know why she does that, but we had her in our room because it was going off. So we put her in our room. We shut the door. There's this huge firework. And then, boom, she starts tearing off of the frame inside her bedroom. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? Like, and, and so she hates fireworks. I hate fireworks, okay? So she's like her dad, right? But we both hate fireworks, all right? And so 4th of July, there are going to be a lot of fireworks. And I was thinking about how to begin today. And since it is 4th of July, I wanted to kind of throw out some 4th of July facts, right? Some fun facts. I looked them up. There's, there's a lot of them. I only took three of them that I thought was cool, okay? And so, number one, here's this one 4th of July fact. President Zachary Taylor died in 1850 after eating spoiled fruit at a 4th of July celebration, okay? So raise your hand if you prepared fruit for the, <laughs> the celebration today, all right? Yeah, make sure your fruit's washed and clean and it's good to eat, all right? So, he died. Uh, number two, the famed Macy's fireworks show in New York City uses more than 75,000 fireworks shells, and that whole thing costs about $6 million just for fireworks. Are you serious? $6 million for fireworks? Aye, aye, aye. So, and then finally here, my favorite one, and this morning when we were doing worship practice, I got, a, I got an alert from ESPN, and I'll, I'll share that in just a second. But number three, Americans typically eat 150 million hot dogs on Independence Day, enough to stretch from D.C. to L.A. more than five times, according to the National Hot Dog and Sausage Council. They have a council for hot dogs and sausage, okay? And today, you're going to participate in that 150 mil, okay? And I'm going to participate in it. We went, we bought hot dogs, we bought burgers, but I want to participate in that, and I will today, Okay? Um, I'm hopefully going to be able to at least contribute to 100 of that, uh, 150, okay? But not really, just only two. Um, and then this morning, I got a, an alert. Um, if you're a food person, right, you like to watch. Sometimes I like to, the weirdest things on YouTube, right, I like to watch food reviews. Or I like to watch people eat food, right? Is that weird? Uh, like people do competitions where they time themselves to eat so many things. And for some reason, that's the only way, like, I get to enjoy that food, Right? My wife does not, will not let me do those food things on YouTube, um, and we don't get to go eat out all the time, you know, she wants me to be healthy and all this stuff, so my way of doing that is living through those people on YouTube, right? So, but Joey Chestnut, who knows who he is, right? Joey Chestnut, a famous, yeah, famous hot dog eater, and, and today he broke, he won, he won the hot dog contest, and I believe he ate 76 hot dogs, 76, that's awesome, right? Yeah. So, those are your fun facts for 4th of July. Uh, those many hot dogs, 76 of them, right? And then all of us will contribute 150. So, Galatians chapter 5, right? Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look here at verse number 1, and we're also going to look at verse 13. Since today is a day of celebration of freedom, I decided to, to go along the message this morning about freedom, okay? And so let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1, and then also Galatians uh, 5.13. Galatians 5.1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, right? Another word for freedom. Wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Look at verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, or freedom. 
Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. If you're taking notes this morning, we're going to only be here for a few short moments. I know I say that all the time. My wife says, oh, you're always going to say you're going to only preach for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then we're only here for like 45 minutes, okay? So I'm trying to, trying to keep it down. I know uh, we're going to have some celebration stuff later. But if you're taking notes, the title of today's message is, is Gospel Freedom. Gospel Freedom. Uh, I want you in the next moments look at these three truths about gospel freedom that we see here in Galatians chapter 5. And yet, since today is a celebration of freedom, I thought it would be good to go along these lines this morning. So as we think about gospel freedom, we must start with this truth, if you're taking notes. Number one, what we see here from Galatians chapter 5 is, number one, Jesus has set us free. Jesus has set us free. Galatians 5.1, let's look back at that first verse. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Christ hath made us free free. We find that Paul clarifies for us where this freedom, this gospel freedom comes from. It comes from Jesus. He's the one who has made us free. See, we were in bondage to the law. And yet here in this, in Galatians, you'll see that Paul is is writing to these believers who are struggling with this idea of freedom in Christ and bondage to the law. They're struggling with this idea of wholeheartedly placing their trust in Jesus and that it's not about works or what we do or try to attain or measure up to the standard of the law. There was this group of people in the Bible in Galatians uh, called the Judaizers that would come in and pervert the gospel, pervert what Paul has said that was given to him by Jesus. He was, they were perverting the gospel that it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And for them, the Judaizers were saying, yes, it's Jesus, but it's also these things. You must do these things plus Jesus to be in favor with God. And we know that the gospel is not that. We know that the gospel is Jesus plus nothing, and it equals everything. And yet Paul is trying to tell these people that Jesus has set you free. No longer are you in bounds to the law and to the measurement that you'd have to measure up to. See, we didn't stand a chance to measure true relationship with the holy God. I hope we understand that this morning. There was nothing inside of you, inside of me, that merited a true relationship with a holy and infinite God. See, Jesus would be that for us. Jesus would come and take our place, and he would appease the holy God. Jesus would take on what we could not. Jesus would live out what we couldn't live out. Jesus would endure what we couldn't endure. And Jesus was and is and forever will be our only hope for true freedom that is beyond this world. So you and I, the only reason we have freedom this morning, if you're a Christian this morning, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the only reason you're set free is because of Jesus. Not because of what you've done. Not because the can do, the muster, the willpower. No, it's because of what Jesus has done. And yet Paul is trying to encourage these believers who for so long have tried to measure up and measure up to that standard that's impossible to keep. To understand that Jesus came and fulfilled that standard for them. What I love about the gospel is that the gospel says this. Gospel freedom says this. The pressure is off. The pressure is off. See, any wondering whether or not you're good enough for God is over. It's not this anymore, right? Like, kind of like when, you know, you're wondering if a girl likes you, right? She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. And sometimes we look at God that way. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. And, and it's not that anymore. I remember growing up thinking uh, as a young Christian growing up, for some reason, that's how the Bible was taught to me. I was taught this moralistic type of Christianity that where if I didn't read my Bible for like a couple of days, I would feel this immense guilt and disgust about myself and think, man, God doesn't love me. Maybe if I do a couple good things for the next couple of days, maybe that would be enough to where I can come to God. And I grew up that way, that moralistic type of way to where his love was dependent upon what I did for him. And yet, that's not what the gospel is. And as Paul is encouraging these believers about the law and saying, look, the law is no longer in effect. What's in effect is this freedom that Jesus has secured for you. See, what the law actually brought about, what the law's purpose was, and hopefully you know this already, the law's purpose was to bring these believers to Jesus. 
The law was designed to show you that you could never measure up to this holy standard. The law was there to to be this daunting thing that would overbear you to the point where you had to look for somebody else to do it for you, to the point where you and yourself would come to realize, I can't do it. Ex-Nike, right? Just do it? No, no Nike. I can't do it. Matthew 5, 17 says this, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fill. See, sometimes we think, why didn't God just get rid of the law? Well, the thing is, God didn't want to get rid of the law because he needed a substitute for you to fulfill the law. So Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. You know what Jesus did? He came and he fulfilled the law. He was perfect for you and for me. And yet we needed that substitute to please the Father. And yet Jesus was that substitute. And as I said before, the purpose of the law was to show you and me that we needed a savior and that we could never save ourselves. Do you find that you're always trying to save yourself sometimes in your own power, in your own will? Sometimes even today, we have that tendency, which hopefully I don't jump ahead into the next part, but we have that tendency that when we we mess up, like like what Brother Dustin said last week, which I love in our men's meeting, like when we mess up, like in the beginning, Genesis, when, when Adam and Eve messed up, what did they do? First thing they tried to do was put fig leaves on themselves to cover up what they did wrong. And yet sometimes even our Christian lives, when we've experienced the freedom of the gospel, that's what we do. We run back to the fig leaves and we begin to try to cover up what we did wrong. We mess up. We don't fess up. We run and we find fig leaves and we put them on and try to do it in our own work. And yet the purpose of the law shows that we could never save ourselves. No matter how many fig leaves you try to put on yourself, it's never going to work. And yet Paul tells us in chapter 3 of Galatians, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. It was to set our hearts towards Jesus and look to him to fulfill God's righteous demand. Jesus was perfect for us in, in his life when he was here. And, when, and if you come to the chosen man, if you come to the chosen and you'll see this, this is awesome. But Jesus was perfect for us in his life because he knew that we wouldn't be. Hebrews 4.15 says this, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Think about the moments that you're weak at. The moments where the temptation is there. There have been moments where you've given in. There's been moments where I've given in. There have been moments where we failed. But when we think about this passage, when we think about Jesus setting us free, he had to be perfect to set us free. And yet, in all points, he was tempted like as we are. And here's the the beautiful thing. He didn't sin. He didn't sin. Just because he was God, that's kind of our default thing. Well, he's God. He's, he, he can't sin. Just because he was God didn't mean he got some cheat code. Sometimes we think about it like that. Jesus faced the same temptation, the same situation, the same circumstances of life like we do. Yet Jesus was perfect. He would stood again and again the pressure of the world, not just the world, the pressure of the enemy. The devil, our arch enemy, right? Satan. And he did it triumphantly. And he did it triumphantly by rising from the tomb and defeating sin, death, hell, and the grave forever. Jesus was perfect for us to set us free. And yet he conquered our enemy. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. And he rose that third day out of the tomb. Praise God. Awesome. And yet all of that, he did all of that. Why? To set you free this morning. To set you free. I'm so glad we get to celebrate freedom, right? In in our world, we're talking about American freedom, but even greater than American freedom is gospel freedom. Freedom from real life enemy. The Bible says this, that our enemies, they're not flesh and blood. That our enemies are the principalities of this world right? It's a wickedness, the darkness of this world. And yet that darkness no longer enslaves us anymore. Why? Because we have been set free. He did this to set us free, to give us his righteousness. So when God looks at us, he sees his son. Second Corinthians 5, 21. We just sang this in Jesus Messiah. He became sin who knew no sin. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know what Jesus did? He took his righteousness, gave us his righteousness, took our sin. God had to treat Jesus the way he should have treated us. And now God treats us the way he should have treated Jesus, the way he treats Jesus, right? We're part of the family now. Praise God for that because Jesus has set us free. So number one here this morning, Jesus has set us free. And if you're saved here this morning, if you've trusted Jesus as your savior, place your faith in him, you're free this morning. You're free. Number two, I love what Paul does here. He gives you this reality. Jesus has set you free. Point number two, stay in the freedom. Stay in the freedom. Galatians 5.1, let's look back at that first verse. Stand fast, therefore, in the freedom, the liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free. Why do you need to stay in that freedom? Because look, we have that tendency to be entangled again by that yoke of bondage. By that yoke of bondage. And Paul's saying, stand fast, stay, be stationary in this freedom. You and I have a tendency as Christians to want to be enslaved again. We want to put back the chains. We want to get back in the cell. Sometimes we have short-term memories. (laughs) And Paul says to these Galatian believers, don't be enslaved. Jesus has set you free, so stay free. Don't run back to the law. Don't run back to the chains. Don't run back to trying to earn what Jesus has earned for you. Stay in the freedom. See, I believe sometimes that we think that the gospel freedom is too good to be true. And let me tell you, if you think about it, it probably is too good to be true. There is no other faith that has this to where you give your life over to a holy God who sends his only son takes your place, merits all of that righteousness for you, gives it to you, to where you can now be reconciled to a holy God whose love no longer is dependent upon your actions, whether you do or don't do. Every other faith is a scale system. Every other faith is you better be good. Every other faith is a God that's angry. Not the Christian faith. The Christian faith is the God that takes your place. It's the God that loves you. Understand, hear the thing, that there is wrath. And yet, that wrath, Jesus took for you. To give you that footing, that standing, that freedom to stand in front of a loving God. And Paul says, stand, stationary, stay in this reality. The pressure is off. Here's what I want to say this morning. Stay free. Live victoriously. Don't live defeated. Live like a child of the king who has set you free. Staying in this freedom brings about a new look on your life and how you will actually live it. Living in this freedom will bring about new affections, cravings, and passions. This will bring about that abundant life that John 10.10 talks about. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But this is what Jesus said. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And here's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about this, this prosperity gospel, okay? I'm not talking about this. If you give yourself over to Jesus, he'll give you wealth and everything that you ever desired. No. I'm talking about that abundant life is having God with you in that life. That abundant life is having Jesus right next to you through the hard times, through the, through the bad times. And here's the thing, the Christian life sometimes has the bad times and, and it has the rough times and sometimes the times where you don't even know what's going on times. But what, but what helps along those times is that there's a God who's with you. A God who says, I'm going to be right beside you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will take you through the valley of the shadow of death and I will be with you. So stay in that freedom. I love this, this quote here. So when we stay in the freedom that Jesus has bought for you and for me, we understand that, as I said before, the pressure is off so we can live all out for his glory. See, Paul knows what these believers are feeling. They're feeling this pressure to still try to measure up and earn. 
But here's what, here's this awesome quote that I, I love to go back to. It says this, because Jesus was strong for me, I was free to be weak. Because Jesus won for me, I was free to lose. Because Jesus was someone, I was free to be no one. Because Jesus was extraordinary, I was free to be ordinary. Because Jesus succeeded for me, I was free to fail. What does this mean? It means as we stay in the freedom of Jesus, the liberty that he secured for us is that is this everyday obedience by faith that we can walk in. Obedience by faith. You know, that's what the Christian life is most of the time, is obedience by faith. Well, what does that mean? That means you're not perfect. (laughs) That means you're going to obey by faith. Does that mean you're always going to be, per- that, does that mean you're always going to do the right thing? No, it doesn't. And that's what this is all about. Because Jesus was strong for me, there's times I'm free to be weak. Because Jesus won for me, there are going to be those days that I lose. Not because I want to lose, but because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is sometimes weak. Now, here's the thing. The reason that Jesus was strong for me in all those areas is because there is a holy God. So stop beating yourself up because you're not perfect. And stop trying to earn what Jesus already earned for you. Now, here's the thing. See what Jesus has earned for you and live out victoriously for him. That means, yes, when sin does come around, I can fight sin. Why? Because Jesus won for me. I can live free. And yet, here's the thing. I know sometimes when we see this type of truth, we ask ourselves, okay, well, if, God, if Jesus already secured everything for me, I'm free to fail, I'm free to lose, I'm free to be weak, those things, then I can do whatever I want to do. I got a license to do whatever I want. Is that the gospel? No, that's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't free you from sin to go sin. The gospel frees you from sin to fight sin. The gospel frees you from that bondage. See, look, if you think the gospel has freed you to live out your life, the way you want to live out your life, you traded bondage for another bondage. That's what you've done. You've traded chains for another chains. See, when the gospel has set you free, when Jesus secured the freedom for you, he freed you from the bondage. And yet in turn, that should allow you as a Christian to want to live your life for him in each and every way. Now, Paul knew this was going to happen. And so let's go to verse 13. Paul knew that this might kind of sneak in, this idea that, well, Jesus secured everything for you, so now you don't have to do anything, but just do whatever you want. Let's look at verse 13. It says this, For brethren, you have not been called unto liberty. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty. Only use not your freedom. For what? For an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. See, number one, Jesus has set us free. Number two, stay in that freedom. And number three, you want to know what freedom looks like in a Christian's life? Number three, we have been set free to lovingly serve. We have been set free to lovingly serve. See, sometimes in our American thinking, we think about freedom and we tie it to selfish things, personal choices, independence, and we really never tie it to service. You see, Paul goes from the start of this freedom in Jesus to stay in this freedom, to work out this freedom in your life. What does it look to stay in the freedom of Jesus, and how does that manifest in my life? Well, Paul says this, don't take the freedom that he secured for you so that you can run off and do whatever you want to do. He says, take the freedom that you've been given and go out and love people, serve people, true freedom is giving yourself over to people, to loving people. See, we have been set free from ourselves and to others. We take this freedom and serve with love those in need who are in and out of this church. See, this doesn't just pertain to believers. This pertains to people outside of our church, people who've never heard about Jesus, people who need the gospel. And yet we serve not because uh, we have any underlying uh, objective or some underlying um, uh, motivation. We serve because that's what we've been set free to do. 
to love people, to serve. Let me ask you, are you served? Do you, one of the, one of the questions is, do you have lost friends? Do you have people who don't know Jesus in your life that you are ministering to, that you call friend, that in hopes at the end of the day, through Jesus living through you, one day they will live, Jesus will live in them. And yet we've been set free for that type of ministry, that type of love. B.B. Warfield says this on the self-sacrificing love of Jesus. He says this, self-sacrifice brought Christ into the world and self-sacrifice will lead us, his followers, not away from, but into the midst of men. Whenever, wherever men suffer, there will we be to comfort. Wherever men strive, there will we be to help. Wherever men fail, there will we be to uplift. Wherever men succeed, there we will be to rejoice. Self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice means not indifference to our time and our fellows. It means absorption in them. It means not that we should live one life, but a thousand lives, binding ourselves to a thousand souls by the foulments of so loving a sympathy that their lives become ours. I love that, that one phrase he says, It means not that we should live one life, but a thousand lives. As a Christian who models after Jesus, true gospel freedom really is being freed to be like him. True gospel freedom is really to be freed to be like him. Jesus, when he came, he was a king from another, from another world, right? He is the great I am. He is the comforter. He is the prince of peace. He is all of these mag- majestic titles, and we see throughout scripture, but yet one of the most amazing things about Jesus is that he was a minister, and he served. He came not to be ministered, but to minister and to give his life a what? A ransom for many. See, he came and he bent down. What did he do for his disciples? He washed their feet. The God of the universe, the one who created those feet, was actually the one to wash those feet, to give us an example, to show us that, hey, we are no better. We are not above serving people and loving people. You want to be free in your Christian life? Serve somebody. You want to be free in your Christian life? You want to live victorious? You want to live uh, uh, undefeated? You want to live in such a way that Jesus lived? Serve. Find that opportunity to serve those around you. Find that opportunity to show Jesus through your life. See, that's what gospel freedom is this morning. Freedom for the Christian is not being served, but serving. And true freedom is freely giving up time to enter into the lives of others. So this morning, we have seen that Jesus has set us free and that freedom is a place, is the place that we must stay and live so that we can manifest this freedom and service in our lives to others. Let me ask you a couple questions. Let me ask myself a couple questions this morning. Are we free this morning? Are we living free this morning? Are you thankful for the freedom that Jesus secured for you against sin, death, hell, and the grave? Are you thankful that you have this opportunity today to serve and love others? See, the Christian life is a free life. And I think the world needs to see that. I think the world needs to see us living free. And I love this truth who the sun sets free this morning is free indeed. You're free indeed. Let's pray.